Welcome to EWA's FinLit Podcast. EWA is a fee-only RAA based out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We hope all listeners of this podcast will benefit as we deep dive into uh, complex financial topics that we will make simplified for you. And we hope that this really serves as a catalyst so that you can make the best financial planning decisions uh, for your family and also save time. In this week's episode of the FinLit Podcast, I'm joined by Sanjay Manon. Sanjay is a family medicine doctor here in Pittsburgh, and he is the founder of Health is Wealth, which is a concierge medicine practice also here in Pittsburgh. So we're going to talk about his journey through residency, working for a large hospital, and then ultimately why he chose to start Health is Wealth and why he believes that concierge medicine is um, a better alternative to medicine within a large health system. So if you're a physician and you're considering starting your own private practice, stay tuned. We're going to go into detail about how Sanjay made that decision and what went into that, uh, making that big jump. Sanjay, thanks for uh, joining us today. This week we have Sanjay Manon. He is a uh, physician here locally in Pittsburgh. He is also personally my doctor. We have a, a close business relationship and friend relationship. So excited to be here and dive into some interesting topics. I appreciate you, Jameson. It's, uh, we're going to have some fun today for sure. Cool. Sanjay, give us, um, give us what we need to know from your early years, childhood up till age 18 that we need to know to understand who Sanjay is today? I think with, with anyone, it's, it's nice to go one generation back to kind of figure out you know, who they are. Um, so first generation Indian American, grew up in Southern uh, West Virginia. My parents were from a state in India, Punjab. Um, and uh, dad is a metallurgical engineer, kind of an old school Indian guy. Um, and uh, my mom is a computer programmer who works at Marshall University. Uh, and so they definitely, they try to keep us close with a, kind of a conservative bring up, but then you, you walk out the door and uh, you're in rural West Virginia. So it was a, an interesting place to grow up. Um, and then to try to get out of the house a little bit, I know my mom wanted me to go to Marshall, but I was a bit of a traitor. Um, I went to West Virginia University for exercise physiology so kind of tried to get out of the lab a little bit and uh chose exercise phys where our labs were working out and um nutritional uh making nutrition plans and things like that it was, it was pretty fun time um and then undergrad after that went to med school at wvu as well did you um that's interesting so the the diet and nutrition is going to segue into exactly what you're doing now but did you know you wanted to go to med school i, I think you can, you know, immigrant parents from India, you had one or two options. It was literally like, okay, you're going to be an engineer or you're going to be a doctor. Um, and I, I definitely gravitated towards uh, math and sciences, which didn't help me narrow it down with those two. Um, but then just long-term relationships and, and talking to people, I, I enjoyed that. So that kind of led me into uh, to medicine. And so. then when did... Um no, you're definitely a very good, you have a lot of very good, like, I guess I could say network, just like relationships with a lot of just mm -hmm. different people, very good at that. So how, so that's interesting segue then into like family medicine, what you do now. When did you know that you wanted to go into that specialty? So for me, it was a process of elimination. And even when we talk to med students now, we have med students from Drexel rotate through our office. Some of them don't know what they want to do. And so we just kind of reassure them. I reassure them that, hey, it's okay in your third year not to know. Get through your third year and, and know what you don't want to do. And, and so for me, I kind of knew that I didn't want to do surgery. Um, then you narrow down populations. So do you want to work with kids? Do you want to work ob gyn which is a specific population? And I found that I, once I knew I wasn't surgical, I really liked everything. Um, I shadowed with a couple of family practitioners. And when you look at their schedules, they've got an 18 year old well visit and then a 65 year old visit. Um, so you're never bored and you have to be comfortable not knowing everything, um, not being the expert in the room, but then engaging that patient and establishing rapport. Uh, so I liked that about family medicine. And then I also liked the opportunities outside where when you get into your career, you can work in a hospital, 
you can work outpatient, you can work in an urgent care, you could start your own business and see all populations. So that not being bored doing the same thing every day, that kind of attracted me to family medicine and then that process of elimination. Cool. And then just being able to connect with people and actually being like face to face talking to patients. You've got about 20 minutes to establish a trusting relationship. Oh, that's interesting. About the most important part of that person's life. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, you definitely have to develop we had a lot of good mentors um, in, in doing that. So that's such a great skill. I mean, any, a lot of careers, business, that's such a good skill set, being able to like quickly develop a relationship with somebody. So what mentors you mentioned, like what, how did you learn that? What helped? So there, there were a couple of docs that I followed early on and the first five minutes of the patient's visit just had nothing to do with medicine. Really? Like it really was like, oh my God, the summer, mm -hmm. the weather, you, you know, the sports team, whatever it is, you just open up with something that has nothing to do with why they're there. And it's just so comforting to know that you can just talk like barstool to barstool basically. Uh, instead of sitting down and getting right to like, okay, this is what your labs were and like, and let's talk about it. So that, um, that's interesting. We'll talk about in a, in a bit, some of like the, like the pressures put on for production as a physician and being able to, so I, 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 I would, I guess I'm making an assumption here. It's probably easy to fall into like, Hey, I'm here. I'm going to get this patient in out as quickly as possible. But mm -hmm. that, that five minutes of developing the relationship is so important to, you know, the relationship building of the patient. So that's an interesting like paradox, which we can get into in a, in a bit. Sure. Um, okay. So undergrad med school, WVU, and then residency. That's how you ended up here in Pittsburgh, right? Uh, yeah. So I met my now wife who is also a family physician, um, in med school. And so we had to choose an area that had a lot of family medicine residency programs because she wanted to be, uh, in the same field. And we were also two years different in training. Uh, and so Pittsburgh allotted that a, a great opportunity for that. Um, so there are five or six Pitts family medicine programs. Uh, and so we chose Pittsburgh geographically also because she's from Jamestown, New York, and I'm from Southern West Virginia. So right 79, now. you know, grandparents are close enough. Um, and then my younger brother, who's, who's now going to be an obstetrician, is in Morgantown, which is an hour and a half south. So we had everybody pretty close. Cool. Um, so family medicine at Forbes Regional Hospital. Uh, one of the key in choosing that program is it, it was an unopposed program, which meant that you're the only residents in-house if something is called. Um, so when you're shadowing with a surgeon, there are no surgical residents there. Mm -hmm. You're the only one. If you're in the emergency room... There are no ER residents there. You're the only ones there. So you, you definitely get, I, I think, a higher level of training being the only residents in-house. So you got to do more, do a lot of different things. You're not competing for your education. Yeah. yeah. So if somebody's looking into programs, I would recommend unopposed programs for family medicine for sure. And then let's talk about um, right in that time frame. So you... Um, You've worked with, with Matt starting out and then obviously EWA for, for a long time now. And th so through that residency transition from a financial standpoint, um, well, let's talk about first why you're in residency and then the transition to attending. So we talked about, talk a lot about, I know you, you like talking about the money temperature. What's that like going from not making any money to then you sign your first contract financially and psychologically to now all of a sudden you're making you know four times the amount of money? it's it's obviously crazy to see the amount that then all of a sudden is hitting your bank account and you think about all the things that you could use that money for. Um, I've seen residents that then go on to attendings and they're buying, you know, boats and they're going from their four wheel, their sedan to like a luxury sedan or um, they're taking all, all kinds of trips. But but one thing that through EWA is is the plan and, and keeping it simple. Um, especially when with a marriage, we had no idea how we were going to do our finances as far as joint accounts, not joint accounts, credit cards, um, who, who takes care of what. And so keeping things simple and forming a plan has probably been one of the most valuable things for us 
uh, going from residency to uh, um, to attendings. Like you think about a financial advisor and you think about, okay, stocks and bonds <laughs> and how are they going to manage our assets? Uh, but with EWA, there was a level of comfort uh, in, in managing finances and really your life because you think about when it comes to marriage or anything finances can be a pretty one of the the top reasons there can be turmoil and it's not your wife's plan or your plan it's your uh, ewa's plan for you and you both can kind of agree with that so it's, it's kind of a cool thing yeah i think the statistics like finances over it's over 50 or 60 percent of american families say finances are the number one stressor in, in their household and we don't even think about it. I yeah. mean, it's like a, between Katie and I, there's there's literally no thought about what our plan is. Now, the execution of the plan is still up to us, but what our plan is, there's no conversation in our house wow. as far as what, like literally none. Wow. Now, we may, get, we may think about, okay, how well are we executing this plan, but what we're going to do, there's never a question. And it was based off the plan that Matt drew up in 2015, 2014. I mean, it's it's just been the same plan. So, so it's, do you it's kind feel, of reform. Do you feel like fi- like financial stress is like it's probably never completely going away, but like for the most part, between it, it's the only stress we have is execution. Yeah. But what we're gonna do, which is often a lot of your stress, right? You have two decision qu- fatigue. Ex- exactly. Like, are, are you making the right decision? Are you on the right path? Yeah, then you try to seek other advisors. You talk to family member. You talk to the guy on the street. What you you know, b- but we always know what our plan is, which has been so, so reassuring. Awesome. Um, so yeah, great. Appreciate the feedback. Um, so, what advice would you give um, a resident? We don't. Yeah, we don't work with really any residents anymore, but point of this podcast, financial literacy, give financial literacy back to all listeners. Um, what advice would you give to somebody that's in residency that's getting ready to make that jump financially or any, any advice at all that would help set them up to, you know, get into a position like you are where you don't have financial stress? Uh, so I would find someone who could make that plan for you early, just again, because that takes that stress off. You're going to be so busy in your training that you're just not going to have time to think about um, you know, stocks or bonds or what the market is doing. Or So having that plan of like, this is how much you're going to put in your IRA starting off a residency. There are a couple of tricks that I've heard of like filing extensions so that you can put more into an IRA. I don't understand all the details with that, but that was something I told my brother to look into from a tax perspective, like extending your tax year, because then you could put more into more into an IRA. You might, you might know about no, that. You can't, no, you won't be able to put any more and you could fund it later if you extend it. So like if you put, um, if you haven't, okay. So basically as a resident, obviously you're not making, you're, you know, you're making 50, $60,000 a year. So yeah. you may not have been able to fully fund like a Roth IRA for mm-hmm. the year. Cause you know, that's not very much money to live on. Yeah. Um, so if you extend your taxes, you can contribute to it past April. So if you've made three of the 6,000 6, for last year contributions, then if you extend it then till October, you can make the other 3,000. And so this is a perfect example <laughs> of where as a resident, you might see an article or someone else might say, hey, I'm doing that. And then you need that person to go to, to like clarify what is it and then how to execute it. Yeah. So the, the, those are things that I've told my brother to look into after hearing that when he was in residency. Um, th- one of the main things would be just to keep things simple and live close to where you're going to be working. So I saw residents that were living in Pittsburgh and commuting to Monroeville, and they thought, hey, Pittsburgh's got so many things to do. I can walk around and have tea in the morning and this and that. <laughs> but but it's, it's like your life is going to be residency. Just get an apartment or a townhouse that's right next to the hospital. And uh, so Basically, your life's going to be stressful enough. Don't create any more stress living far away, yeah. commuting in traffic. Yeah. You know, we had a great behavioral therapist at Forbes Family Medicine. And he always used to say, it's amazing how difficult people make their own lives. And that's just one example of it. Yeah, yeah. Like if you're going to be working somewhere and you're going to be working long hours, just get a spot near there. Simplify it. Yeah. 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 Um, Okay, so then you started, got a residency, Mm -hmm. and then you since have, this is what I want to dive into, spend a lot of time on. Since have started your own 
concierge medicine practice mm -hmm. what, a year, two years ago, a year ago? Yeah, 2022. Okay. Yeah. Um, so title, I love the name of it, Health is Wealth. Before we dive in that, let's just, yeah. First off, why two questions for you answer these how you want. Why did you choose to name it that? And then tell us about why you made that decision to start a concierge medicine practice. So health is wealth comes from something my dad used to say just all the time. He actually had quadruple bypass at like the age of 49. Oh. He was a super healthy guy. I mean, your standard Indian sport, he, he rocked badminton two or three times a week, wasn't on any medication. And his first sign was that he was just short of breath and he couldn't walk as many miles as he used to walk. That was his sign that something was wrong. He goes in and they're like, well, we're putting you in for surgery. You've got quite, you know, coronary artery disease. So after that time in his low fifties, he just started to say it at, around the house all the time. Your health is your wealth. That's awesome. Um, and I mean, as an engineer and a computer programmer, I think a lot of immigrant families might be able to relate. A lot of their money still goes to take care of their families mm -hmm. in India. So mm -hmm. he was one of 10 siblings, um, agriculture-based family. So not only was he taking care of us and making us feel like we could get anything we wanted, um, but he was, he was sending money back to India. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't really even a fiscal thing for him. It was, it was really just, hey, there comes a time in your life, no matter what's in your bank account, that your health will be your wealth. Mm -hmm. And how much you can enjoy your wealth will 100% be determined by your health. And so that just kind of stuck with us. And it stuck with my brother, too. So, so Sanjay, as you made this, you've made this transition to starting concierge medicine practice, what advice would you give to physicians that are you know, employed by a hospital and they want to be in the private practice space, but they're kind of debating, you know, should I do this? Should I not do it? What advice would you give? So I think some of the mentors that uh, kind of push me that we talk about risk when you're, when you're starting a new business and, and physicians should just remember their value in that their skill set is always going to be needed. And, and so the risk of your venture failing is that you just go back to being your primary care provider, or you go back to being a cardiologist, or you go back to being a pulmonologist. Um, so the, the risk really depends on one thing for me was like my partner, who's also a family physician, just said, hey, she's a team member. She's a rider. Hey, I'm going to go to full time. You go to part time. We'll try this venture. If the venture doesn't work, you'll just go back to being a primary care provider. So one contract ends, you take some time to build your business, and then someone in Pittsburgh still is going to need a primary care provider two or three years from now if you choose to, to go off and do it. So as physicians there's less risk when it comes to starting your own venture. Because you've went to four years of med school, went through training, and it's like now you have this very high value skill set that yeah. is always going to be needed and in demand. You can always go back to what you were doing before if you want. Yeah, that, that was one thing that actually led my father to kind of push me towards medicine was as an engineer, he was employed and his patents were owned by the company. And whenever the company was bought by another company, there were cuts and people mm. were fired. And then another company bought it and they were fired. And so job security in the, in the medical field is something you don't necessarily have to worry about. You're, there's always going to be a need for whatever type of physician you are. So eliminating, just mentally eliminating a lot of the risk mm -hmm. in just doing it. Mm -hmm. And then having that partner has been uh, invaluable in that, okay, you have this dream, you have this mindset of this goal of this, what you want to do with our family and um, uh, how we want to live our life. Sure. I worked part-time for a couple of years while you were full-time. Let's switch it. I'll work full-time. You, you take a crack at this, uh, this business. And then I think um, you're in a similar situation. A lot of people don't make that jump because if you pursue public service loan forgiveness, you have to be employed by a nonprofit. Obviously, if you're in private practice space, you're not employed by a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. um, you've navigated that by still being employed by AHN, working the qualifying hours. What's your thought process around that? Do you feel, did, did you and do you feel tied to the hospital for loan purposes? So, yeah, there's two parts to that question. Number one is, knowing exactly what the financial risk is with each decision. So you walked us through the numbers from the get-go that, hey, if you don't do loan forgiveness, you make 20 years of payment, you're ultimately going to be taxed on the amount that's forgiven, which is a huge number. 
Now, as we know, there are government influences and political changes that could happen that that may not be a thing. You don't want to rely on that either way, but you always want to know your risk, which was invaluable. So then it kind of comes to kind of like your personal ideology, which is like, okay, I'm 36 years old. From 36 to 39, which is how many years I have for loan forgiveness, those are still years of my life that I'm never going to get back. That time with my kids, now my kids are young, they actually want to hang out with me. <laughs> right? So yeah, I could use my loans as a ball and chain and say, I have to work in this job, whether happy or not, I have to work in it because of my loans, or I want to take this risk and do this business. And then you ask yourself, how much money are you going to make in the, your, your business venture? So your loans may not be, um, you know, a grain of sand in what your your profit may be or what you may be making with your with your business. So I think there's a lot of uh, things you want to think about as far as do you know your actual numbers? How comfortable are you with debt? And and uh, then kind of like that, like I'm never going to get these years back. Um, when we're young, we have a lot of earning potential. So it, it's it's less daunting to me that ball and chain. Some people have student loans and they pay them off within five years because they can't stand the thought of having debt. And uh, the thought of having to pay more by stretching out over years, they just can't stand it. And then other people, it just doesn't bother them. I just, I don't think about it. Like I think about after I get home from work, what am I going to be, you know, yeah. doing? So. so it sounds like from what I'm hearing, so obviously knowing, I, I mean, just as a financial advisor, I think it's obviously important to know the financial risk and making 100%. a good financial decision. But on the flip side, you've kind of adopted the mindset of like, so you are still in play HN, so you're still going to be able to get the lens room. But if at any point, you know the number of like, Here's what the business revenue would have to be to mm -hmm. merit walking away, walking away and just paying yeah. the loans off where it's like a net net even financially. And then that gives you peace of mind to make that decision. I think adopting the like you've adopted kind of the abundance mindset of like that's you're not going to limit that's not going to limit you mm -hmm. because you could just say, like, I'm going to just going to work harder and make more money to then pay off the loans if I did want to go that route. Sure, sure. And then let's say, you know, the venture doesn't go through, which you never want to think about three years from now. If I decide, hey, this is something I don't want to do, then I go back and work for a nonprofit for three years and they're forgiven at that time. But then six years from now, I would be looking back like, did I take that venture? Yeah. Like, did I take that leap? The iceberg is splitting. Did I put one foot forward and let it split or did I take the step? You probably would be more upset with yourself if you played out six years from now and you didn't make that business venture, you'd regret it versus you do it, it fails, and then you go back to it. You probably would get more satisfaction in that scenario because you've at least tried it. You don't regret not doing it. Oh, 100%. Because there's also a timing involved too as far as like concierge medicine is relatively new to Pittsburgh. And when we see the challenges of the modern medicine model, somebody is going to come up with these ideas of how to bridge the gap, how to make medicine 2.0. Um, so if you, if you see this, Hey, no one's doing this right now. Let's try it. Yeah. Yeah. You want, you want to do it now. Awesome. Yeah. This is such a interesting conversation because I think like, so if you ask somebody like, what does it mean to be successful? That's like a different definition to every person. But sure. by nature, you think that like, you see these people that we deem as successful, they, you know, they're billionaires, like they make a ton of money. And like reality is like, Sure, the, some people may say that that's successful. Like to me personally, successful is like being very healthy, being mentally, physically healthy. Um, and money is just like, yes, money is a support system to all of that. But if you're so focused on accumulating what we say is like wealth and money mm -hmm. and your health suffers or, you know, maybe success to somebody or wealth is spending time with your family or being, you know, going on adventures and traveling, all these things, then like that's really not wealthy per se. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And then as, as we age, obviously, you know, some people say it's the, uh, the go, go years and yeah. the slow go. And the no, I mean, just to think about how healthy you are during those years and, and how to maximize that, um, we think about maximizing health span over lifespan. Um, there's a pioneer in the f field of longevity, Peter Atia. Yeah, we, we try we to talk about a lot. We, we try to take a lot of his principles and just pass them on to other people. And he, he's I, he indirectly probably mentors so many physicians yeah. um, in choosing what they 
tell their and guide their patients and what they hammer home. Um, and, and just this idea of pushing off disease as far off as possible and, and preventing disease. Um, so that's uh, something we try to do. Okay, we'll dive into that in in a second here. But so love the name Health as Wealth. I think that's I could not agree more. But why did you um, why did you decide to start a concierge medicine practice? And starting concierge medicine, you have to see how far the patient experience has come in medicine already. So you have access to your doctor via your my chart that you can send them a message. You have twenty four seven video visit capabilities after the pandemic that you can jump on and make a visit. Um, so the patient experience has come a long way. So with the concierge model, we're trying to figure out how can we take that to the next level? So patients are still commuting to see their doctor, which takes up some of their time. Um, they're in a waiting room. They're kind of governed by the 20 minute, 15 minute appointment slots. So basically when I was doing outpatient medicine, I thought, Hey, we can do better than this. And we saw that patients wanted more. Uh, and that's where the concierge model, which is not new, by the way, it's a little bit new to Pittsburgh, but that's where, where we thought, Hey, let's, let's bring it here to Pittsburgh. Interesting. Um, yeah, I think a lot of big decisions just from talking to other people and, and listening to, you know, podcast, other people's stories. I think a lot of big decisions like that come from, like, hey, I'm doing something, but this could be done better. And you almost have to like go against the grain a bit because it's like traditional medicine is telling you, you know, to do what you were doing before. And you said, hey, I'm going to try to find a better way to, to do this, which is, which is really fascinating. Yeah. And, and I think sometimes a catalyst in that can also be a negative experience that can say, hey, that'll give you kind of the push out the door. Yeah, was there one of those? So I, mean, I think with corporate med medicine model that like we were talking earlier, there's a lot of pressure to see yeah. hey, volume and growth when you mix business and administration with medicine. There's always this clash of medical doctors want to spend more time with their patients. Um, they want to do less administrative work as far as documentation. Um, so there's, there's always this clash. And so the other thing is that your where you practice your medicine is at the hold of your corporation. So they may say, hey, we're going to put you in this office. And then based on a certain metric, another office is doing poorly. We need you to go over there and help that office. So th there were instances where I was moved from office to office. And when you enter medicine, you want to be especially family medicine. You want to be that old school family doc that you go to the grocery store, you go to the high school football game. It's like, oh, Dr. Manon. Uh, you have this great long-term relationship with your, your families that you take care of. And, and when, you're, when your practices move three or four different times. You can never do that. No. And then your, pa your patients are then following you mm. from location to location. So their patient experience goes down and you being their PCP. And the idea from a network is that that patient is not yours. Yeah, it's the hospitals. Or that the patient is that network's yeah, patient, the networks. right? There's no doctor. The doctor-patient relationship is there, but ultimately it's this network's patient. Mm. And so that was kind of my catalyst for, okay, I don't want anyone to tell me who my patients are or how long I spend with my patients. So in a typical day working for a network, I might see 22 people a day. On my concierge days, I might see one or two patients a day. I'll go to their house an hour and a half to two hours, mm -hmm. spend that with them. Somebody comes in with a grocery list. They want me to look over it. I do that. Yeah. Their high school student the son wants me to look at his uh, weightlifting program and how can he put on five pounds. You can do that. So you leave that experience, that two hours with that family, so rewarded. And then you spend your time documenting on the one to two patients you had that day instead of the 22. Yeah. So. so that's interesting. So, yeah, I mean, just from working with so many physicians, like the con, you literally have RVU targets and you're, you're compensated mm -hmm. on volume. Yeah. So yeah. it's, um, not good or bad, but it just makes, I would assume makes it difficult to give that personalized, like you can't see a patient for an hour when you, you know, your paycheck relies on how many yeah. patients you see. Yeah. I, I think a, a lot of times you'll see patients having bad experiences with physicians. And I, I always wonder what the situation was. Um, so oftentimes, like you, like we were talking about, a doctor has 22 patients to see for whatever reason, one or the other party is late. And that just that the whole day can then go mm -hmm. into a spiral of being late. 
typically your lunches are spent doing administrative time. You're, mm-hmm. you're doing catching up on your notes. You're responding to your MyChar messages. So with the concierge model, you text your doc, you call your doc directly. The concierge physician may have 50 to 200 patients that they're taking care of, yeah. literally. Yeah. And uh, in a corporate medicine model, you're talking about 1,500 to 3,000 patients. And so that in itself is going to have a a patient experience where if you send a a MyChar message to your doc, there's going to be several layers of screening. Ancillary staff is going to be screening those messages. Which one should actually reach the doc? Because the doctor isn't being paid to do MyChar messages. There's no revenue Mm. generated in MyChar messages or returning phone calls or doing prescription refills. So all the staff is trying to offload that and work as a team with the physician. Um, and so that is taken away from the concierge model where you just have direct access. Yeah. Okay. Two things to there. One, I, I'm going to plug you cause obviously I'm a, uh, I'm a concierge medicine patient and I think it's like exactly what you said. So same thing with why people work with a financial advisor is to eliminate decision fatigue. Like I'm going to an, an, use an analogy for an advisor. Like realistically you could go online, spend hours researching, you could figure out what to do with your investments. Same thing with medicine. You like you wouldn't you wouldn't be you're not consulting a, a doctor, but like if I spent hours and hours and hours researching, I probably could find a solution to something m- medically. Mm-hmm. Um, is it correct? You'll have no idea. You'll have decision fatigue. Like you'll you'll you consult people, but having that go to person that I can call you with a random. I've, I've asked you some pretty you know crazy ridiculous questions, but mm-hmm. calling you with that question on the spot and just getting that immediate decision affirmation saves so much of my time. Mm-hmm. And then I don't have to go to a, a office anymore. And before, you know, I was driving 30 minutes to go to your office and then 30 minutes back where it's like, now it's like, call you, get something done. It makes my life 10 times easier. And then I can focus on the things that, you know, actually matter, like working with my clients and doing the things that I enjoy doing. And it's been a total, just total life changer. Honestly, I think, I think, uh, yeah, big proponent of concierge medicine for sure. Well, good. Good. I appreciate that, James. And I think w- one thing that'll be interesting for people to notice is how young and healthy you are and you're still finding value in the concierge model. Yeah. Because one of the, the biggest things that people say is, well, I'm, I'm too healthy. Like, or I'm, I'm, why would I, you know, pay a membership fee or get a concierge medicine physician? Because I, I don't go to the doctor very often. And, and so the fact that someone as young as you are, that is as healthy as you are, can still find value in, in the questions that you have that are health related, that's, it's, says something. So two components to that. And this is what the second thing I was going to say, based on what you said a couple minutes ago was like seeing 3000 patients or whatever the number is mm-hmm. like that answers my, one of my questions would be why, like, how can people be more proactive? I, I've, I've always felt medicine is very reactive mm-hmm. as in like you're not get you're not getting a test done until you have a symptom which then it's too late and it's like it's just very reactive and so that makes total sense so, you know if you're working with 3000 patients like that's why mm-hmm. um and so i've it's helped me so i i've seen some just personally like family health stuff and then it's kind of driven me to be like i want to be super reactive about super proactive about this sorry not reactive mm-hmm. super proactive about this from a young age and just like i ask you all the time like what are things that like um, what are things that I could be doing now that people don't do, you know, for 20 years just to make sure that we're like ahead of the curve. Mm-hmm. Um, and that has helped me so much. One, just giving me peace of mind that like, Hey, we're screening for everything possible. We're doing all the tests. Like I get a ton of like once a year we do like intense blood testing, which mm-hmm. like a 20, somebody in their twenties, is not generally doing that. Mm-hmm. And so it's helped me just get peace of mind that, you know, we're on top of things. And I'm also prepared. Like I like to, I just have like an optimized mindset, optimize my health, optimize, make everything as efficient as possible. And so mm-hmm. being able to optimize that has just led to, like I said, you know, being able to spend time with doing the things that I enjoy and that, you know, really matter. And it eliminates that stress. Just like ideally our relationship with clients as a financial advisor eliminates financial stress. Yeah. I, I, one thing that you brought up is like, okay, so once a year we do blood tests and it's extensive. I, I want to point out that the blood tests we still do are still very evidence-based because that can be one critique of, of a concierge model or even executive health in general is that 
let's say you're the CEO of a company, they pay for an executive physical for you. So that executive physical is anywhere between five and $10,000. You get sent to the Cleveland Clinic or some other large specialty clinic. And there are all kinds of tests that are run on somebody maybe in their 40s that they don't necessarily need to have done. And in that testing, there can be incidental findings, which then cause mental stress for that person. And if anything is positive, those doctors are ultimately going to say, go follow up with your PCP about this. And then you go back for your executive health physical the next year. So there's no, less continuity of care mm -hmm. often in executive models that focus on like this executive physical. Yeah. It's like, hey, we're going to give you this benefit. We're paying for it for you. You're going to go and you're, you're this executive and you're going to get the special physical. And often it's tests that are very expensive that you actually don't need. Whereas if you had continuous your goal may be to lose weight or something else that requires a higher level of touch, a higher frequency mm. uh, of communication. It's much more personalized to your situation. For, for sure, yeah. for sure. Rather than, okay, here's a, a blanket executive physical that we're getting for all of our... Um, so I, it'd be, it'll be interesting to see how executive health um, evolves. evolves over the next... Yeah. Because th those executive physicals don't necessarily reduce your sick days. Yeah. Um, you're still having to, to call someone or go to a doctor's office to, if you get sick. And they, so um, there are studies that are show that, that there are a lot of incidental findings and it's not evidence-based and it doesn't actually reduce sick days. So, so it'll be interesting to see how that evolves. Interesting. Um, and then one other story I want to tell about um, just finding value. So I, we work out at the same, work out with the same trainer. And so he was doing, we did like an intense uh I did like a body fat scan, super detailed on myself. And uh, it was, I wanted to be, I, I had this just belief in my head that I want, I was like, oh, I'm like, I want to be single digit body fat. Mm -hmm. And so it comes back, I was not single digit body fat. And I called Sanjay like freaking out. I was like, I, I need to like lose body fat. Like, this is crazy. Mm -hmm. And he just kind of just kept peeling the layer back. Like why, why, why? And so I thought about it, I was like, that's like stupid. It's such a stupid metric. Like I'm obviously like, my general health is great. Like, why do I need to, it's like a meaningless metric. So being able to have like, just, I guess my personality is worrying about things that are like, just trying to like over overdo it mm -hmm. and worry about things that like don't really matter when the reality is like my current body fat, my general health would be like, probably five X better than it would be as a single, a single digit body fat. Undoubtedly, for sure. Unless you're preparing for some type yeah. of meat, <laughs> meat, like bodybuilding meat. Yeah. And then even those bodybuilders would tell you that the way they feel on those meat days is often not very yeah. good. Yeah. They can't wait to get out of that phase of training. Yeah. Um, so for sure. Yeah. So Sanjay talked me off the ledge and uh, it was point of it is just having somebody that to, you know, have that decision affirmation and challenge your, honestly, somebody challenge your, thought process and your beliefs to, you know, question what you're thinking and really dig a layer deeper has been super helpful. Sure. Um, okay. So a couple of things, we'll dive into some more health stuff here in a second, but let's talk about, so now you're on this entrepreneurial journey, you're still a physician, but mm -hmm. now you're building this practice. Um, I found, so even like financial advisors, a lot of good advisors are very horrible business owners mm -hmm. because I mean, even if think about it, the analogy of like, if you own a gym, you start out as a trainer and then eventually you realize, oh, I could turn this into a business and you're like, you're really good at personal training, but you're never taught how to, how to like run a gym. Mm -hmm. And so in any industry, you could find this analogy. But so going from like physician, actually being a practitioner now to business owner is you're still doing both, both things. Obviously you're seeing patients, but what has that <laughs> shift been like? So I think, the shift, there was a little bit of understanding the business of medicine when I was in private practice okay. um, with, the, with that group, just listening to uh, their leaders talk. I've tried to keep it very simple with that transition as far as just, hey, profits and, profits and losses, what's my overhead, what's the number of patients I need to hit to make up my salary for what I'm currently doing part-time. Uh, so, so just trying to keep it very basic. The word entrepreneurial is, is an interesting one because when I hear that, I think of someone who's capitalizing mm -hmm. on like a market and it with the aim of making a profit where I think 
I had this mindset was just having more control. Interesting. Just having more of a say. Like it bothered me if there were a group of people uh, in a meeting that were making a decision about my day-to-day life and I wasn't at that table. So I think that's that's the word entrepreneurial now means to me that you're at the table. The autonomy. And- yeah, you're at the table about that discussion. Like somebody once said that uh, I think uh, if you're if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So that entrepreneurial sign for me now is that I'm always at the table when it comes to decisions about my life as far as how much I'm going to work or going to earn. So that was the shift. Not necessarily. I didn't go into concierge medicine thinking that, okay, I'm going to make a whole bunch of money. Grow this big yeah. enterprise. Yeah. No, it was, it was more like, okay, through this, I can get more control over my life and do the things I want to do Interesting. and care for my patients the way I want to care for them. Yeah. Um, so that's where, Hey, like an hour and a half visit, however much the patient needs, I could go to their house. I've only got maybe one or two people I'm going to see that day. That to me is, is priceless. Um, aside from how much I might bring in that year. Mm -hmm. So interesting. Has it been a different, like, if you had like new, is it a different skill set that you've had to learn of like the business side of things? So I I think the skill set now is all the ancillary uh, members of my team, since we're small right now, uh, for instance, I don't have a schedule. People often ask me, like, let's say, so HIW, so health is wealth. It's, you say we, who, who is we? And, and I, I think I just feel uncomfortable saying it's I, yeah. but, but for instance, right now I am my medical assistant. I am my front office. I am my, uh, the telephone that's, that's always ringing. So I think maybe as we grow, we may look into ancillary staff, but the biggest adjustment for me is staying organized with, okay, how am I going to keep these appointments straight? Every six months I'm seeing this person. This person wants to be texted every week to remember to stay hydrated and to stay within their budget. I got to remember to, to be on them. Um, so every patient is so personalized in what they want from the concierge model. And so how I deliver that has mm-hmm. been the biggest adjustment. And, and we learn so much from our patients as far as what they want and how they find value in the service. Um, so for instance, we have one family, the family is in their fifties. And so they're dealing with aging parents and decisions to make for their parents' health. They don't have relationships with the primary care providers for their parents. Like you're saying, they can look up online all they want about their parents' medical conditions, but they still won't know whether they're making the right decision. And so they will call often and we will give them, advise them as to like, you are making the right decision based on the things that you're telling me about their health. Or we'll go as far as calling the doctors for their parents to have that discussion and get more information for them. So how much bandwidth does it take for that individual as an executive who's trying to manage this company, but then he knows that, hey, something's going on with mom or dad that I got to make this decision. So we offload all of that from them as well. Um, so learning from our patients as far as what their needs are has been has been pretty interesting. So that's kind of the adjustment. All right. So let's get some, some just general health tips for anybody listening. Um, let's start with... Just and since you've been so helpful with with giving me a lot of health advice, if we were to like, I love the eighty twenty analysis. Like, mm-hmm. what's like twenty percent you could do that make up eighty percent of the results? Um, what's like twenty percent health change or like just smallest health change that like most people could make that would have a huge impact on their on their life? So we can start with just like what would make a huge impact on someone's life. Um, so number one is, is going to be exercise. If you're looking for a pill that's going to reverse disease, um, that's going to lower stress, that's going to improve sleep, that's going to hit all every check, every box, it, it's going to be exercise. Um, what we found is when it comes to longevity specifically, it's not going from a lot of people think you have to do a lot. Like you have to do resistance training and you have to, you have to do cardio and and you should stretch you should do all these things and do them every day of the week it's not going from three to five days that's going to make the biggest difference or from five to seven days it's not for those elite athletes who are trying to take their eight minute split to a six minute split for their miles what we found for longevity the biggest difference in health actually comes taking people to like the 30th or 40th percentile out of everybody so getting someone from the couch 
to even just exercising one or two days a week. So a lot of times with patients, I'll talk to them about like a loss aversion, that whole idea of like when you tell people what they're missing out on, what they're losing, it, it can motivate them. I can tell people all day like, hey, if, if you work out, you might lose weight. Well, it's not going to do anything. But if someone doesn't work out right now and I say that, hey, even once a week, if you worked out once a week, that would be 52 workouts in a year. If you don't work out once a week, you're losing 52 workouts. Mm -hmm. How better would you how would you feel if you just did 52 walks for 30 minutes, whatever it is? So that first quartile and then being active the rest of the day, go for one vigorous walk once a week and then stay active the rest of the day. Even something like that can improve longevity, as simple as that. I think Peter Tia talks about this a lot. Like walking is actually like if you just said like what's an exercise that will improve longevity, like literally going on a 20 minute walk, like yeah. you would do it. Well, I, I love also when he takes it to the the next level of rucking. Yeah. I now have two or three patients and, and I'm talking about these, these women are like mid seventies, <laughs> never worked out a day in their life. And they come to me and they're so excited at their next physical. They're like, doc, my son, he Amazon me a rucking vest. So I have this one, this one patient, she has a, a weighted vest and she's gradually increasing the weight, five, 10, 15 pounds. And all she's doing is walking around her neighborhood. And now we're showing that that can increase bone mineral density because it's, it's adding weight and uh, tension on her lumbar spine and her hips. So walking with weight, rucking. So when he talks about walking and then advancing it for bone mineral density with that rucking, it's just it's kind of cool stuff. So basically my takeaway is just if you're not doing, if you're not doing anything, yeah. like just do something. And yeah. You don't need to. I, um, I've adopted with exercise, and less is more. Like I could get a 10 minute workout in if I'm super busy that day and like that's still beneficial. So. And, and actually you with your wearables, that's, I mean, that's yeah. kind of interesting with the, either whether you have the aura ring or the, the whoop bracelet or your Apple watch, you notice that your recovery and your heart rate variability and, and a couple of other metrics actually improved when you were working out less. Yeah. I, we can tell that. Yeah. I'll get into this. I am like obsess over my whoop probably yeah. a little bit too much. I've had this conversation with some other doctors of like, yeah, but then it gets to a point where like just in conversation, like, oh, you, you know, then you obsess over it. Is that good or bad? Um, but I actually, so for basically for two years, I was going to a gym that was like classes and it was like, you know, tread, like treadmill weights. And I, you, you, it was, a, it was like an intense workout, like 500, 600 calories you'd burn a day doing that five, six days a week. And then just with my busy lifestyle um you that's fine in my opinion to train like that but then you have to sleep eight hours you have to make sure you're eating like mm -hmm. spot on you're recovering mm -hmm. and so i noticed i wasn't eating enough i mean i wasn't i was sleeping enough but not to like recover on that mm -hmm. rigorous workout routine and so my all of my whoop data hrv um my recovery, all this stuff for like, I noticed was like not in, not getting better. Mm -hmm. And so we sat down and analyzed it and we realized, okay, I'm overtraining. Mm -hmm. I'm not eating enough. I'm eating healthy, just not enough. And I, and then on that workout routine, I need to sleep more. So I totally like shifted it. And now I fit it into my, my busy schedule where it's like, I'm maintaining the same amount of sleep, which is still healthy. I'm just diet didn't change. It's just making sure I'm eating enough. And then now I'm exercising. I have two long workouts per week with with my trainer, but then outside of that, it's just quick 10 to 20 minute workouts whenever I can fit it in my schedule. And it's been like, to, to directly answer what you said, it's been my my HRV has increased significantly. Like all of my actual mm -hmm. trackable data is, is there. Yeah, So no, absolutely. So the, the number one thing like we're talking about is, is exercising and we see the biggest difference in longevity in that first, getting people to the first quartile. Interesting. So, um, the second thing actually kind of relates to finance, which is knowing your budget. So if you don't know your basal metabolic rate, if anyone takes anything from this today. This is it. Yeah, you've helped me with this. It's yeah, so yeah. helpful. It's just go online, calculate your basal metabolic rate, use the sedentary number as your basal metabolic rate, and manipulation of that budget, how many calories you take in, is literally all that's the number one thing. The first number we tell people to know is what their budget is. 
And then from there, we can calculate a deficit if you're trying to lose. We can give you a surplus if you're trying to gain. Um, but I, I'm, don't, I'm not worried about your carb intake, your fat intake. The first thing we do is know your budget. Yeah. That's been helpful because like I, I had no idea and I was under eating. Yeah. And then knowing, hey, here's like the baseline your body needs to operate. And then yeah. whether you track it or not, it's just like now you kind of get a feel for how much you like. Yeah. If you don't know that, you overeat, I think, a lot. Sure. Just knowing portion control, like how much, how many calories are actually in what you're consuming is like. Yeah. You, you talk about caloric density in food. So we have staff that will, will be, you know, have these little Hershey's things that are sitting there. And one or two of those is 250, 300 calories. And so I have people come in all the time, Doc, I don't eat a lot. Um, but what they're eating is so calorically mm. dense that is putting them over budget. So often what we'll do is we'll have them unadulterated, get an app like Lose It or My Fitness Pal, or just pen and paper, old school. And for seven to 10 days, it's a pain in the butt, but track all of your calories, everything you're putting in. And then compare it to your budget. And then most people have that eureka moment, like, well, no crap, no wonder I'm not you know, losing weight. My budget is 1800 and I'm consistently getting 2200. Well, at that rate, you're actually probably going to gain close to 15, 20 pounds in the next year. So that budget, knowing what your budget is and doing an unadulterated check. And if you ever feel like you're not meeting your goals, recalculate your budget. Yeah. Like so just being aware of. Yeah. And I do that with you like probably like twice a year. I'm doing it right now, actually. Yeah. Um, I don't I don't want to track my calories all the time. But like no. for, for two Nobody weeks. Nobody does. Yeah, Nobody does. Two <laughs> weeks, twice a year. Yeah, yeah. I'll do it. Yeah everything that goes in my body and then it just kind of helps me calibrate then for the next six months. And then I've found that about every six months I need to just like check in on it. But yeah. no, I think just having the awareness has been huge. But so your two, two big tips would be any type of movement and mm -hmm. then just being aware of what's, you know, your budget is and what's good, mm -hmm. what type of food you're putting in. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, well, that's super help helpful. And then anything, Okay, so another question. What what could people do to be more proactive versus reactive with their health? So the first thing is is that once a year annual physical with, with, with your primary care provider and having the conversation of what is your family history um, because that kind of guides how proactive we're going to be. Okay, so Jay, so this has been super helpful. What if people want to follow you or find you or learn more about concierge medicine, where should they go? Uh, so we have a website, hiwconcierge.com. Um, there's a LinkedIn page. There's a way to message me directly through any of those. Um, that would probably be the most, the most back, effective way. Thanks for, for joining us today, Sanjay. It's been super fun. And like I said, concierge medicine has been life changing for me, so cannot uh, promote it enough, but it's been a lot of fun. Appreciate you for having me, Jameson. And EWA, obviously, like, like I was saying, in the last 10 years, we have never questioned our plan uh, as far as uh, our finances and financial future. So it's, it's been reassuring for Thanks. sure. Appreciate the feedback. Thanks for tuning in to uh, our podcast. Hopefully you found this helpful. Really hope this is as beneficial and impactful to as many people uh, across the nation as possible. So hit the follow button, uh, make sure to rate the podcast and please share, uh, with any friends or family members that would also find this beneficial. Thank you very much.